Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Landvestor session. I'm glad you're all here and a special warm welcome to our German guests. We'll start with a short introduction. For those who just tuned in, uh, this uh, session is part of a work conference, High Tech High Green, about the importance of landscape for companies in the area of the Green Corridor. Today, we're broadcasting live from the Green Corridor in Eindhoven uh, as part of the program of the Landscape Triennial 2021. The Green Corridor is a really a mix of high-tech businesses and landscape developments. Uh, on the top image, you see the slow lane that runs throughout the Green Corridor uh, for cyclists and pedestrians. And uh, at the moment, we are in the building in the lower right image, the Brainport Industries Campus, which is a combination of education, high-tech companies and government. In the process, and also this morning, we've spoken with stakeholders from industry, government, NGOs, about new ways of collaboration and co-investment in the landscape. This breakout session um, is an exchange between two regions around the topic of landvesters. The Green Corridor in this session meets a German region, Kraftraum Terra Nova, part of Rheinisches Rivier area to discuss the relation of landscape and economy, and also discuss the idea of landvesters. But what are landvesters actually? They are citizen groups and companies who develop and invest in landscapes. We think this is an emergent topic. And uh, last year we've uh, made a quick scan worldwide of some initiatives and best practices. You can download our presentation at deltametropole.nl. We found three types of landvesters. First of all, the donations, the crowdfunding, and also business models. Just to give you a few quick examples, in the Peninsula Open Space Trust, big tech companies of Silicon Valley invest in the landscape around them to maintain it attractive for their employees. In Frankfurt, the, the airport is investing in Regional Park Rhein-Main and its park infrastructure. Uh, nearby here in Land Park Assisia, heritage conservation goes hand in hand with healthcare, business models and hospitality services. And in Aden, uh, there's a crowdfunding campaign going on for a food experience place called Smart Park. But why are landfesters interested interesting for high-tech regions? We think there are several reasons. First of all, uh, in these regions, there's normally a big transition in the landscape going on. And uh, the regions also need to improve their business climate to attract and retain talent. Uh, for the businesses themselves, it's also very useful to think about landscape and invest in it. They can use it, uh, among other things, for corporate identity. Some companies even use it in their logo types. Look, landscape is increasingly also seen as a location factor in the battle for talent. Landscape keeps the employees healthy, productive and inspired. Uh, landscape also helps in the transition to a bio-based circular economy. Uh, it is a license to operate and also a green infrastructure for companies. For example, to have lunch meetings, um, let people sport in the, in the lunch break or to have events. And it's also a possibility to do CO2 compensation and to work with co corporate social responsibility. We've been working on this uh, topic of landvesters in a multidisciplinary team. We work together with Cecilia Brown um, to connect with our German peers. We work with landscape designer Jonas Papenborg. We'll see him in a minute from the office Flux and with uh, landscape economist Joost Hagens from Bureau Buiten. And we're partly financed in this endeavor by the Creative Industries Fund of the Netherlands. So uh, our, our purpose in this project is to explore the potential of landvesters in the two regions, see how they can accelerate and broaden the existing landscape ambitions in the region. We want to demonstrate the landvester business case 
and also envision a landfester governance strategy. So how can you work together with these landfesters? Uh, let me stress that the proposals that we're about to show are fictitious, but they're also realistic. They're based on the real stakeholders that, uh, and their motives that we found in the region, and also uh, the real landscape metrics that we found. So fictitious yet realistic. The program for this morning uh, is as follows. First, we will see short pitches uh, of the two regions so they can get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, we'll discuss the, the common challenges and um, also ways they work on the challenge. And then we will see two short Landfester proposals, one for each region. They'll be presented by our team. And uh, we'll end with some discussion uh, with the stakeholders and also the audience. So um, let me also tell you that this session is being recorded. So uh, we uh, would like you to manifest your ideas, but uh, note that it's being recorded. Um, so first of all, I would now like to ask to the floor our first speaker, uh, the head of structural change and climate protection at the city of Bergheim, Frau Dr. Ruth Langner. Can you please share your presentation? The floor is yours. Reduce CO2 emission. And um, from this, um, we decided to end the mining and the burning of coal at the latest in 2038 instead of 2050. Um, here on, this, on the left-hand side, you can see um, the whole area of um, Rheinisches Revier in this uh, brownish, um, light brownish, um, color and um, you can see here um, the open pits which is here um, Inden, here um, Garzweiler and um, Hambach. Um, the cities um, of the so-called Kraftraum um, are situated here, here and here. So the, there's Bergheim, Bedburg, Elsdorf um, and this is um, the area we are zooming in on the next slide. Um, here you can see um, again um, Elsdorf directly at the edge of the pit. You can see here um, Bergheim um, with um, the, the power plant and um, Bedburg. And here, um, as you will see later on, there is the so called speedway. Um, and I think you will hear more from the speedway in the, in the later talk. Um, so what is um, the, the challenge for us? Well, um, we already have a high, a really high unemployment rate. And um, the, the power plant and the pit um, had very good industrial jobs, well-paid ones. And now we will lose direct employees or direct employees will lose jobs. Um, and also um, employees from component suppliers at um, the level of about 9,000 jobs um, only in these three cities. So to, um, yeah, to tackle this issue, we need more um, jobs. And um, there we come into a competition for space between industry, farming, as you can see, there are several, there's a huge farming area here and um, nature and also for living. Um, and some of us are even, um, yeah, some of us have, uh, have more challenges than others. As for example, in Elsdorf here, um, looking for the ground itself, Elsdorf loses um, one third of its former um, ground to a lake. So the soil will not be replaced after finishing of um, brown coal mining. So the, um, this leads me directly to the changes in the landscape. So um, on the left hand side, you can see a map um, how it should look like um, uh, several years in the future. Here you see now um, uh, lakes instead of, um, instead of pits. And um, here again, I, I sketched um, the, the area of the craft home. So what, is our, what are our challenges? Well. Um, we do have these lakes and this means, um, and also we will have, we have already a hill here, the so-called Sophienhöhe, um, which is a hill from excavated earth. 
and this will stay. The lakes will stay and um, the, the, the hill will stay. So we have a reduction of space uh, for industry and living um, and um, a restructuring of the room. So where's the problem in this, in the restructuring? Well, neighbors are now divided and even are divided in between cities, as you um, may see here. Um, in Bergheim itself, we had a former um, open coal mining. The soil is now replaced, but um, the, um, the um, former pit now divides the inner city parts, um, which are lying here, from the others. Well, these are um, the challenges, but we think we could also gain a lot. Um, we will gain biodiversity, um, for example, um, especially at the Slovenhöhe. Um, the lakes will be hopefully um, a touristic destination and we will have really more green infrastructure than before um, starting of the coal mining. Well, these um, are challenges and here are coming some examples how we want to tackle these and um, how we want to go forward. Um, regarding industrial jobs, we have several um, areas where we want to settle industries, like here at uh, Bergheim, um, which is called Inca Terra Nova. Um, here, the A, so called A61, um, there should be um, industry um, located. And um, near the uh, power plant, where there was a former, uh, formerly a power plant plant. plant so a power plant was planned at this area and now um, there should be other industry um, here. This on the one side, on the side of the uh, mobility, we do now have longer ways to go around um, lakes and to go around hills. Um, and on the other hand, we want to um, reduce and aim to a CO2 reduction. So we will have um, new old streets, which will reconnect areas which were separated before where it's possible, we um, will have uh, a tram um, through the Rheinische Revier. We um, want to have more shared mobility, also on demand um, shuttles and um, have, um, want to have more bike infrastructure. Um, to um, address the loss of trainee jobs, we um, will, or we, we plan to have um, educational place at uh, Puffendorf Castle, which is located here, a nice um, castle in uh, Bergheim. And also we uh, would like to implement a digital university. So these are just some, some few examples. And um, with time, we will see whether we will lose more or yeah, win more, uh, gain more from this process. But um, I think we will until then when we want to make our efforts and every eight count. So this should give you a, a short overview on our challenges and um, what we are planning to do in Kraftraum Terra Nova. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. If you could unshare your screen. Uh, I have a, a question. I think you're uh, describing a very big transition in your area. It's um, I mean, it's, it's, maybe it's not even possible to, to make it bigger with, with those big uh, mining pits. Um, you, you end your story with uh, the aid. So you could use, uh, you'll make every aid count. Are you expecting uh, any aid from the businesses in your region? Yeah, we are hoping on this. Um, actually, now everybody is looking on um, money from, uh, from the state. But um, businesses um, will, I think they will join in when they see that they will gain something um, due to this process. Um, one example could be that they um, will um, give money, extra money to these on-demand shuttles so they um, could be reached more frequently um, um, so that um, trainees uh, could reach them and they will have new um, employees. So this would be just one example how we think they can, can uh, contribute. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to ask uh, Jonas to uh, take the floor to present the Green Corridor area.
for the discussion, we have uh, Rob Foots uh, from the municipality of Oorschot and uh, Paul Winkelmolen from the municipality of Eindhoven uh, representing. But uh, for practical reasons, Jonas is going to present the region. Uh, are you ready, Jonas? I'm ready. All right. Jonas Papenborg. Yes, well, welcome everybody. Uh, yeah, I will shortly present the Brainport region and the Green Corridor. Of course, we had already a lot of info in the first hour, but I think especially also for the German guests to get a little overview of what's this uh, Brainport region and Green Corridor about. So first, starting with the Brainport, uh, yeah, we're really talking about this area around uh, Eindhoven, which is really uh, characterized by a lot of high-tech oriented uh, businesses, uh, in Eind not only in Eindhoven, but also in the uh, towns around it. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, this area is really characterized by uh, this typical Brabant landschap, uh, which really a patchwork of uh, city, villages, forest patches, uh, uh, stream valleys, uh, so really a uh, combination of city, villages, and landscape. And uh, yeah, well, when we started with this project, uh, we already started with kind of quotes or like uh, interesting uh, viewpoints uh, which are going on in this region in different uh, region agendas and master plans. And, and actually, all these agendas and master plans are somehow saying the same thing that. Uh, the strength of this region is really this collaboration between city and villages and landscape. And that also gives the great value uh, and also gives it a really uh, great value to being this smart region. And also, uh, that's also where we talked already a little bit about this morning, that it's really important to, for expats, uh, they say this landscape is really important and really a key factor of settling in this region. So. Yeah, really this combination of landscape and cities and high-tech industries is really uh, one of the core things of, uh, of the brain board. But it's not only about uh, really creating a pleasant living and working environment, there are also other uh, important challenges going on in this uh, brain board region. One uh, challenge really surrounding uh, the brain board is this agricultural transition. It's one of the biggest pig farm uh, areas of the Netherlands, a lot of nitrogen uh, uh, deposition in the region, uh, but also big climate challenges. It's the higher sand uh, ground of the Netherlands, which in uh, the summer has to uh, suffers uh, can suffer from droughts, while in the winter uh, there can be problems with floodings, especially around these uh, stream valleys. And the last part, is, uh, last challenge is that. Because it's such a patchwork of uh, villages and cities and uh, infrastructure uh, going through it, it's really uh, nature is quite fragmented in this area. And there's a lot of effort uh, put in really connecting these different nature patches. And if you zoom in uh, to this uh, uh, green corridor, uh, yeah, first start a little bit. What is this green corridor? Well, the green corridor, uh, in short, it's one of the uh, wedges, like one of the green wedges around uh, Eindhoven, really connecting the city of Eindhoven to the surrounding uh, countryside. And it's uh, really an important uh, connection to this countryside, uh, but also a place where uh, this high-end businesses find a place and also an area which is still uh, partly used by this uh, agriculture and where you're searching, okay, what's this future of this, uh, this different functions together? And I think in that sense, it's quite similar to uh, the bigger brain port area. And uh, in 2014, there uh, was already uh, a fishing made for the Green Corridor. An important element of this fishing was really this uh, backbone of the slow lane and the planted tree line. So a really green corridor with like four or five lines of trees with uh, a slow lane uh, uh, underneath it and then connected to this uh, green corridor, all kinds of recreational developments could uh, take place. And if we uh, zoom in a little bit how it looks like, I think it's quite, quite representative for the whole Brainport region. It's really this uh, patchwork landscape. So you really have some uh, estates, uh, some header fields, 
uh, industries around it, but also smaller villages of Oorschot and Best and the bigger city of Eindhoven. Uh, and if we go a little bit back in time, so where all the developments took place before we saw a lot of cultural heritage sites, interesting places are mainly around uh, Eindhoven and Oorschot. And this area in between is a little bit, uh, yeah, it almost seems a neglected place. Uh, and also, if you look uh, what developments already took place in this area, we see it's really interesting to see that there was a strong connection with uh, Philips. Uh, Philips invested already quite a lot in uh, the area around the Green Corridor, but mainly up to the, uh, the Highway A2. And you see a lot of different things uh, Philips uh, did in this region. So a couple uh, areas like uh, the Stripe uh, R and Stripe S are really the uh, old industrial uh, areas, but also like the Wielewaal, it's an estate. Uh, you have a couple of uh, parks around it, like the Philips Park and the Philips van Lennep Park, but also like the uh, Philips Fruittuin. It was already mentioned in the in the first hour that it's a really inter a really uh, used place by the expats now already. And for example, the Mispelhoof, it's a restaurant and they're all like once settled by Philips. And if you take a step to the future, uh, yeah, we had like a lot of talks with uh, municipality and other stakeholders. Uh, we try to uh, map them already as well, all the stakeholders. And we saw that a lot of developments are going on in this, uh, this area. So uh, for example, this Brainport Industry Campus, uh, this is the place where Paul and Merton are now at the moment. Uh, they want to extend it like uh, two, three, four, or even five times, really let it grow. And also uh, the day per day, uh, we already talked about big business area uh, of Westfields. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, uh, yeah, development of business park, but also uh, like natural developments, like uh, creating a new stream valley, uh, ecological connections along a small stream, but also uh, redevelop uh, uh, the military site uh, a little bit further so that it can be a recreational attractive. And also a smaller village like Oorschot, they're really searching on this site for new developments, uh, like for housing, but also for new forest and multifunctional agriculture. So if you look at uh, the Green Corridor, uh, where before Philips was this uh, strong player up to this highway, now we get really a large uh, uh, yeah, list of new players uh, having to do something with this green corridor. And that really made us think, okay, how can especially this concept of uh, landfesters be used to uh, boost all the developments of uh, the green corridor and the concepts uh, which are already there? Thank you, Jonas. Um, I think that was a pretty clear presentation. Um, can I ask uh, Paul and Rob to uh, react on the, uh, the German case? So uh, do you, um, from your area of the green corridors, do you see actually that you share the same challenges as um, Kraftraum? I think we share uh, mostly of uh, the same problems, but I think, uh, also a big difference is if you look uh, at the infrastructure, um, we are, I think, a lot further in uh, reconnecting uh, our both municipalities, Oorschot and Eindhoven uh, together as uh, the Green Corridor. Um, so we have the bridge already and also over the channel, uh, there's a, we are developing uh, an, uh, a new bridge. So the infrastructure is, uh, is uh, almost uh, finished. And now it's time to uh, to fill the green corridor with all kinds of new uh, initiatives like uh, uh, the land art objects, and that's uh, yeah, that's a big difference between uh, between uh, the both uh, the both regions. Yeah, you're in, in another phase of development, uh, perhaps. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah, and you see also, yeah, it in both presentations, if if it comes at uh, new talent and. Uh, um, Bringing them in in the new businesses that's uh, that's a yeah that's a a problem that that both regions uh, regions have. Yeah. Paul, do you agree on that? Or do you see another link with uh, with the German case, Paul Winkelmolen? So far, no. Yes, Rob and I are in the same room, so we had some back back sound. 
I tried to plug in. I can hear you fine. Uh, but uh, nice to see you all. Um, I, I see we all, we both share space around old industrial heritage. Uh, they are, they were used to uh, one of the biggest uh, companies to ensure work and employment. Um, in both cases, it's changed. Philips is not the biggest uh, uh, industrial player in Eindhoven. The brownfields are not the biggest uh, employer in, in Germany. Um, and in Eindhoven, we had the luck or the, 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 the development that there are other players taken in the room and, and taken um, the employment to maybe another high, a higher level. We are now Eindhoven is not a regional player anymore, but maybe a, a brain pot region on, on, on global scale. Uh, that's a, the difference with Germany. I don't, don't think they have already another uh, industrial player providing uh, uh, employment and with that uh, uh, regenerating the economy. Let's, uh, let's ask, uh, Paul. I think that's a good question. Um, can uh, somebody from the, the Kraftraum area, Ruth or Claudia or Boris, uh, could you comment on this? So what, what is the perspective, actually, the, the economic perspective you have in your area? Because I think there are things happening already. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. I, I'd like to, um, uh, to answer your question. Um, I think um, we have very good perspectives uh, because we are um, uh, in between three big um, metropolitans, uh, between um, Aachen, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe four, uh, Mönchengladbach, um, but uh, most important, Düsseldorf, our uh, main capital of uh, North Rhine-Westfalen, and uh, Cologne. And so um, the pressure uh, coming from um, uh, coming from there, from these uh, uh, big uh, and and um, uh, big country, uh, big cities, was was a very um, um, strong force um, in this region. Um, it's it's a it's a good perspective. Uh, on the one way, uh, on the other way, but uh, the problem is um, that um, our uh, development of landscape with these big holes of um, of the uh, production. Um, these are uh, it's it's, um, uh, it's a big restriction for us in this part, and there is no no place, uh, there is no space anymore. So it's big. Um, uh, um, um, I don't know what Konkurrenz situation bedeutet. Yeah, Boris, you must help me. Competition. Um, competition. It's very, competition. Uh, <laughs> yeah, competition. Yes, uh, competition. It's 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 uh, it's uh, that is not ausgedrückt. Competition. Yeah, Konkurrenz is more in the negative uh, sense. Ne? Um, uh, that uh, that you could, uh, um, uh, sag mal, um, everybody needs uh, these uh, spaces, and um, and it's not uh, um, it's not in the ownership of um, our <laughs> Stadt Bergheim, uh, and that's uh, another problem uh, that uh, we are. Um, so RBA uh, is still in, in charge addicted, of these areas. Yes, uh, we are addicted. And of they're the blocking big certain development. Yes. So. Yeah, that's um, an interesting. Uh, Problem. Also, I think Philips had a sort of a same role here in Eindhoven, where they also left at some point in the 90s, mm. and uh, the city had to reinvent uh, itself. Mm. Um, maybe we can uh, get into that um, later after the Landvester proposals, because I think it's now interesting mm. to uh, see some of that and uh, discuss more in depth these uh, these ideas of what could businesses and also yeah, inhabitants of the area contribute. Maybe a little uh, intervention, Martin. Sure. Uh, I see uh, the parallel with F, the, all of Philips uh, 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 ownership, they also all, all were gated uh, areas. Nobody get, could get in, get out, and it was monofunctional. That's mm -hmm. the same with the pits. You can say there is a fence around it. There's one user, one, one, uh, one, one type of use. And uh, when you can get an, an interaction with the companies and you can get a multi, multiple use to it, you, you open the fences, you can say, then you have a diversity and a unique environment in your area that can, you can make the best out of it. So we yes, opened the, all the industrial, industrial heritage. heritage. It's really of great value at the moment. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a, it, it makes your area special. It's different than other uh, regions. So it, it could be a... a, a a unique value in your area if you ex exploit it on the right way. 
yeah, the first signs I think are also visible in uh, the Kraftraum area of that, uh, where um, you, there are places where you can experience these big mining areas and where there will be uh, a lake also in the future. Claudia? And like, um, I agree to you, uh, Shaw. Um, uh, the problem in Kraftraum is that, um, uh, I think Boris uh, uh, can agree to this too. We have this timeline uh, that our big players like RWE uh, already are um, under production uh, till the year of 2038. So uh, we have to plan now without knowing uh, what are the expectations in 38. And yeah. um, so that's a big problem for us in Bergheim, especially because we have the, 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 the mining coal, oh, right, the, tra <laughs> the translation of Braunkohlebahntrassen, uh, these, yeah, coal mine these are the trains, the coal mine the train track. lines. Yeah. yeah, we have two of them, uh, which are, would, could be very important um, uh, for the whole region. Um, but uh, um, in 20, uh, 2038, and before this time, uh, we are not allowed to, um, to use it uh, or to plan about it because um, it needs a plan Feststellungsverfahren. These are form, formal, um, formal uh, yeah, uh, planning Genehm Genehmigungen, Frau Braun. Uh, also, uh, formal, it it's formal planning instruments. Yes, yes. So um, it's very difficult uh, to, react, uh, to react as um, the, um, the city uh, Kreisstadt Bergheim um, because um, uh, it's not in our, uh, uh, yeah, we, we cannot decide uh, this right. point. So it's really a, a planning problem, a planning yes. system problem also. Yes. Uh, maybe Landvesters, the private initiative, could play a role in, in doing these things differently. Let's see. Um, I would like to ask uh, Jonas to share his screen again and show one of the proposals for the Green Corridor, Landfester proposals. Yes. Well, I can make it full screen again. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so based on analysis and talks we had, we started to think, okay, how can uh, landfesters help uh, creating this green corridor and growing this green corridor? And we do it with the case we call the uh, tree grid. And I will uh, yeah, explain a little bit what this case is all about. Uh, and first to go back to what I already presented in the analysis, uh, this uh, yeah, Green Corridor is really an area where a lot of new developments are uh, taking place. And uh, yeah, when we looked to our eye laces of these developments, we saw like three interesting uh, uh, projects or elements or parts in this Green Corridor popping up, which might be interesting for uh, uh, this Landfester model. And the first is... Um, about uh, the Eckers ride. It's this old stream, uh, which is uh, flowing through uh, this new business areas. And we thought, okay, there is a big chance of connecting the new businesses which have to develop here with uh, creating this ecological connection zone and creating like an uh, interesting uh, campus landscape around this uh, Eckers ride here. Uh, another part is uh, about the Oorschot patchwork. What we really saw is that uh, the municipality of Oorschot uh, really has uh, big plans with uh, the edge of Oorschot, both for housing developments, but also creating more uh, a landscape patchwork with uh, tree patches, but also with a multifunctional agriculture. Uh, and actually, this really plays where both planting trees as new housing developments as future of agriculture. Uh, take place. And the last thing where we will focus on now is all about the tree grid of the green corridor. And that's about uh, uh, planting, uh, uh, yeah, especially this slow line. Uh, so there are plans to plant it with uh, a four double line of trees. And uh, in this area uh, along the uh, the Wielewaal, uh, already uh, the trees are planted, but for a large part of the green corridor, uh, these trees still have to be planted. And we thought, okay, how can landfesters uh, play a role in this? And uh, first we thought, okay, why would uh, landfesters invest in this tree line? Uh, and we think that uh, especially companies, but also inhabitants of the 
uh, region uh, of Oorschot and Eindhoven have, have a lot uh, to gain from planting a grid of trees and develop, for example, forest patches and park areas along uh, this green corridor. And it's mainly about improving a quality of life uh, along the corridor uh, by creating new recreational options and uh, improve, for example, the air quality in this region. But also uh, with creating uh, a lush green environment, uh, they can also really attract and attach uh, high educated workers to uh, these business areas. And on the long term, perhaps even with planting more and more trees, making regional CO2 compensation uh, possible and as kind of model. Uh, but also they need things for it to make it realize. Uh, for example, uh, if we protect now this green corridor on the land ownership, a lot of this uh, uh, trees have to be planted on government owned land. So uh, there need to be an interaction with uh, a governmental organization. And also uh, yeah, to make it really happen, uh, they're really searching for how can we make uh, planting trees as easy as possible. And uh, also, uh, can we have kind of flexible regulations to really uh, yeah, speed up this whole planting of trees and also make it possible to scale it up uh, and to realize, uh, for example, CO2 compensation certificates in uh, the region. And also, they are really looking for planting, uh, for example, trees in the region instead of planting it in other countries. And what's this uh, tree uh, grid all about? Well, I told already uh, before, this is uh, in the middle, you see the image of, uh, I think, the start of the vision in 2010, uh, really the idea of planting this four line of trees with a slow lane in between. But also in the talks we had, uh, it's all interesting of, uh, for example, combining it with sport facilities as well. And also to cre really create a platform where you can buy trees and really plant them, but also like, uh, lookout points or land art points, uh, and perhaps even combine it with agriculture. Um, and what we thought of this uh, land fest model, we thought, okay, it would, uh, why we choose this tree grid? Also because it's really nice to scale it up. Uh, so you can perhaps start grow uh, a small uh, with planting, especially this uh, uh, this slow lane, and and plant that with this double line of trees. So that's the really the, the first part of starting with this land faster models. And uh, we think with really starting slow and really start this uh, uh, with planting this first tree, we think with a land faster model, we can like uh, get 500,000 euros. And how can we get these 500,000 euros? Well, it's mainly by, uh, for example, uh, a crowdfunding campaign. We think we can with planting these trees, we can start a crowdfunding campaign where uh, companies, but also individuals can buy a tree, for example, uh, uh, 50 euros, and you get, get a certificate that you own this tree, and perhaps you get even a small sign next to your tree that it's really your tree, that you really feel attached to uh, these trees. Uh, another part where we, how we can get this uh, amount of money is by large donations, just for example, creating an artwork along this green corridor. Uh, we think that, for example, three companies uh, who all invest 50,000 euros, we can arrange this uh, artwork. And the last part is, uh, uh, yeah, to get the last of the 50,000, uh, 500,000 euros is by subsidies from province and uh, municipalities. And what can we do with it? Well, we think with uh, these certificates, we can plant like almost 4,500 uh, trees, so almost finalized already this uh, green corridor, uh, but also we can realize one of the land art uh, elements along this green corridor. And uh, also we can uh, realize the maintenance and management uh, of these trees, because they have to maintain, be cut it after a while, so uh, also therefore we uh, reserve a, a little money. And then if you already have this uh, uh, tree line uh, realized, we think we can also scale it up. So really to the whole wedge of uh, the green corridor and really create a lush structure of uh, tree lines, of uh, a small forest patches, of a forest combined with agriculture. So really create a, a landscape around this green line. <laughs> And uh, we think with yeah, scaling it up, we can uh, uh, get like around $2 million. Uh, and, and part of it comes from continuing this uh, crowdfunding campaign. 
And instead of buying a single tree, you can say, okay, I buy a whole line of trees or I buy a whole landscape element. But we think mainly we get uh, can get a lot of money by uh, large donations about really uh, new companies who start to settle here and say, okay, we really want to invest in it. Uh, and the last uh, part can be uh, provided by subsidies, uh, not only from province and municipality, but also uh, European Union can contribute. In. And what can we do with this land investment of uh, 2 million? Well, uh, we think we can uh, plant another uh, 1,000 trees, uh, but we can also really uh, realize a couple of big uh, interesting recreational and uh, land art structures like a lookout tower or a land art uh, element. And also, of course, the system is really growing. You need more uh, money for this maintenance and uh, management of the whole uh, region. And the last thing we think, okay, uh, as soon as you're finished with uh, this green corridor area, you can also think, okay, what if we really scale it up and really scale it up to the whole uh, Van Gogh National Park or Groenewoud uh, area. And that's actually the area between uh, the three uh, big villages, Eindhoven, Tilburg and uh, Den Bosch. And there are already a lot of in initiatives going on in this region about planting trees. So there are in the Groenewoud, uh, I saw that recently they planted like uh, a couple of thousand trees, but they're also busy with uh, there are a lot of tree planters between Tilburg and Zuid-Hertoge uh, and they are, for example, busy with uh, the Versailles of the North to create a network of tree lines and tree patches, which are also recreational, really attractive. And we think with this initiative, we can connect with this concept of the Versailles of the North and really create a strong network of tree lines and tree patches in this whole area. Uh, and we think we can uh, get a land investment of, uh, we can, uh, yeah, get uh, 10 million uh, of do uh, euros from uh, land investors. And part of it is again by this crowdfunding uh, campaign, like we introduced already. Uh, and also these large donations can continue like we uh, told already, but we think we can really gain a lot of uh, money with uh, carbon credits as a new element, because if you really start to scale it up and you're really able to create big uh, and large forest patches, uh, it becomes really interesting for companies to really plant trees also for their carbon uh, compensation. So uh, we think we can uh, yeah, gain a lot uh, with that again. And what can we do? Uh, well, again, we think we can uh, uh, yeah, really create a lot of new trees in uh, uh, yeah, this regional structure, but also really with this CO2 compensation, we can really create like 200,000 of 20,000 uh, new trees and also purchase the, the land with it. And also create some more larger structures like land art, lookout towers and things like that. Thank you, Jonas. I think that was your, your final slide. Uh, I think... Um... Due to the time, we uh, it's better to go directly to the second proposal. Lea, can you share your screen for Kraftraum and try to stick to the time more or less? Yes, I will do my very best. You can see my screen, right? Yes. Yes. So, uh, so now we're going to look into the German region and I would like to introduce you to one of our pitches that we prepared for the occasion. Um, so while we were looking for a pilot area for both regions, we decided that to look into the craft home, craft home area for the reason that we already mentioned earlier. And uh, in this first phase, we mapped a lot of the on ongoing challenges and the ambitions for the region, but also the future projects and the important stakeholders. And with this overview in mind, uh, we were able to define three first concepts that uh, we're going to work out in the coming months. But briefly, I can walk you through those three. There will be the Kraftraum Innovation Ecosystem, which is a concept that um, relies on the collaboration between knowledge institutions and their campuses with the idea of an integrated mobility and innovation destination uh, concept. We also uh, are going to work out uh, what we call the Forum Terranova Land Office, 
which is a concept where we would like to integrate a new alternative uh, working location overlooking the open cast mine to the mobility of the Kraftraum area and its future plan. And finally, the food wave. And uh, the food wave is the concept we're going to be discussing today. So, um, so we're going to continue to develop these three concepts over the summer towards yeah detailed proposal for our final publication. So please bear with us. But um, looking into this foodway concept, uh, the area of interest is situated along the speedway. And um, it would be an initiative that would start from the farmers of the area. This is not, yeah. Um, so indeed, in our concept, the farmers of the Kraftraum area uh, would have understood that there is a lot to gain from participating in the agricultural, agricultural transition. And they would like to start the development of maybe permaculture or agroforestry and more direct ways of selling their products throughout the region. And how would they do that? They would uh, start creating a cooperative called the Foodway. And with this, they're hoping to be able to improve the sustainable food and entrepreneurship climate uh, in the area. And that in order to make it attractive for them to transform their farming practices so they can remain on the long term while complementary businesses could maybe join them. And the goal is really to improve the quality of life in the craft home area uh, will, with including attractive countryside and a vibrant food culture, but also sustainable and healthy products. And this should really help to strengthen the uh, identity of the region while keeping the farmer in business and in control and also to create awareness with both the participants and the visitors. So we think that, or they think, <laughs> that could be possible uh, through the implementation of this cooperative structure, but as well as new types of agriculture, like uh, strip farming or strip cropping, but also maybe complementary businesses such as farmer's shop or long pinko, which avoid all kind of middleman situation. And maybe also, why not, a system of fresh uh, deliveries or products towards uh, neighboring cities. So in the next few slides, I would like to walk you through three different steps regarding the project's implementation as Jonas did. And please keep in mind that uh, those steps represent different scale and of investment and impact within the landscape, but also different timelines. So in step one, uh, for example, we imagine that two farmers would decide to create this foodway cooperative and to shift their agricultural structures towards strip agriculture. And uh, how would they also firstly, let's say, sell their product? Well, maybe they could use the public space that is adjacent to the food campus to sell their products directly from the field. But then our main question is, who are the investors then? And in other words, uh, where does the money come from? Well, in the first step, we assume that by forming the cooperative, the farmers would, of course, increase their revenues on direct sales, but we're also counting on a crowdfunding campaign to raise some important funds. And of course, we're also hoping that there would be some European subsidy which would support the farmers in their uh, transitional, uh, let's say transition within agriculture. And investment wise, what does this mean and how the money is then being spent? Well, firstly, um, of course, to help the foundation of the cooperation, but also to help uh, part of the landscape investments that are needed for the transition. So planting trees, flowers, ditches, all of that. But also we think that some of the money should be spent on the sales and the marketing of the cooperative. And of course, most of the expenses will go to equipment costs that are eventually also needed in this farming transition. But if we would go towards a step two, where eventually 15 farmers are part of the cooperative and transition it towards strip cropping, that would result in a greater variety of products. And at this stage, the cooperative could also be able to develop its own factory, where the farmers would be able to uh, transform raw products into maybe a dairy, soup, or jams. But also, the cooperative could own its own farmer's market, where they are directly able to sell produce from the land to, to well, citizens every day. And next to these main investments, we thought that the cooperative could develop a system of fresh deliveries throughout a bike courier system towards neighboring city. And this will really help in making the cooperative just more popular and known. So in the second step, we assume that the cooperative will raise more revenues 
thanks to the direct sales, uh, the farmer shop and the new delivery box system, but also the crowdfunding campaign will remain quite present and involve uh, more and more citizens as it becomes more popular. And subsidy wise, next to the European subsidy I already mentioned, um, we're thinking of a new subsidy, which would be more of a local one from local government, which could eventually help with the development of new paths and routes that would be leading to the farms of the cooperative. So investment wise, where the money will be, what is the money serving? Well, of course, still the cooperative uh, cost also regarding landscape investment for this transition towards strip cropping, but also additional equipment and marketing costs. But one of the new feature here is the food factory, which will of course require quite some investment. And this new farmer shop, uh, as well as the whole system regarding boxes uh, and yeah, this courier boxes delivery system. But we are not done yet. There is a third step that we like to speculate upon. And well, in this last step, we're thinking that maybe there would be a hundred farmers joining the cooperative, which represents now quite some hectares around the speedway. And uh, well, this project will be now well known in the craft realm, craft realm area, thanks to its farmer shop, its factory, the deliveries, but also, and that's a new feature, um, there would be a food court and a pilot farm, which uh, would be those, let's say, new important features of this last step. And at this stage, we're also thinking that eventually regional programs regarding nature and recreation, such as the Freiraum vision, could also support the project and help in the definition of destination and their accessibility. I mean that this way, the region and the cooperative would help uh, developing together a view on regional green and growth model. Mm. How would that happen? Well, of course, investor, investors wise, it means more revenues coming from the cooperative and the new features. So the pilot farm, the food court, more delivery abonnement, but also some business to business channels and also just more citizens joining into the crowdfunding platform and helping for the creation of these new features. And, um, Again, this new type of subsidy, which is a combination of the European one for transition and uh, the, reg the regional program for nature and recreation, so more state, local state subsidy. But we do really think that this way, the food court can be fully financed, the pilot farm as well, which is an area where uh, the visitors can learn about strip cropping, uh, be aware of new kind of food production, but also uh, we could have these um, new features, which would be the new recreational routes for pedestrians and cyclists that could be developed and participate to the attractiveness, attractiveness and growth of this model where agriculture is uh, meeting with the landscape. Thank you very much, Leia. Yes. Uh, I think you highlighted very well in your presentation uh, the scalability of the Landfester concepts from small, medium, large. Uh, and also uh, the option of mixed financing, so to combine all kinds of, of money streams. Yeah. Um, before we go to the reactions by the, the stakeholders, I would like to ask Joost uh, a quick question. Uh, we, we saw a lot of numbers. Um, and could you say you, you did some of the calculations? Of course, it's all work in progress. Uh, we were still working on this to get it, to get it right. Um, could you tell me, do you think the landvesters are really a serious stakeholder in landscape development? Does it really mean something in, uh, in, in the scale of money? Uh, and is it difficult to estimate what they could do? Well, I think it's a promising, uh, it's a promising concept. And um, if you look at the, the interest that uh, people uh, have for their, um, especially their direct environment, and you see the info involvement, and I think that this is the same in the Netherlands as, as in Germany, um, the involvement of people in uh, nature organizations, um, uh, then we see a growing attention um, uh, let's say from from the population from from inhabitants in in regions uh, to participate in these kind of projects you also see it in 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 the voluntary um, work uh, being done in um, landscape maintenance um, where you see an increasing popularity especially uh, uh, now in, in in corona days uh, but I but I but I will 
I think it's it's something that's not um, maybe it's uh, fast growing now, but uh, it, it will stay, I guess. Um, uh, and um, uh, for the from for the from the business side, um, I think there is also a growing awareness that quality of life, quality of living, is an important factor, especially in the attraction and and keeping of of talent. It is, however, difficult uh, uh, to estimate uh, this in terms of um, uh, how much money can it generate. If you uh, are realistic, then you will say um, uh, that at the moment, these um, numbers are still relatively small compared to ambitions that we have in terms of uh, climate uh, deals, et cetera, where we have much larger um, uh, steps to take. And um, it, this private uh, money is still relatively uh, uh, small, but there is a growing potential as is shown in the different models, e.g. Um, in um, uh, uh, one of the concepts that, um, uh, what, that Jonas presented, we have these um, voluntary um, CO2 uh, certificates. Um, uh, I guess that we are either, uh, it's, we'll see a growing voluntary um, uh, buying of these, uh, these kind of certificates that uh, companies say, well, we're going to offset our CO2, CO2 emissions, um, or we will get um, further um, uh, um, laws uh, that um, make this an obligation. Right. Thank you, Joost. Clear answer. Um, I would like to hear some reactions from uh, from the regions now, and uh, also about what they think of land investment as an option. Uh, Boris Linden from Hambach uh, early, in an earlier meeting said that he was kind of fascinated by uh, crowdfunding. Uh, Boris, can, uh, can you give a reaction on what we just saw? Uh, is Landfesters really an, an option for, for your region? Yes, thank you very much. I still, I'm, I'm still uh, pretty much impressed by that idea. And, and let me point out, first of all, thank you for, uh, for your initiative, for the uh, proposals uh, that you made out uh, or laid out today. Um, I, I um, especially like uh, the idea of the foodway concept. Um, I think uh, you will need local authorities to moderate such a process um, and probably to fund it in the beginning, especially the infrastructure. I uh, like the tree grid and green corridor idea as well. And I'm, I'm looking to uh, Dennis Moisen in Elsdorf because um, uh, in Elsdorf we have five kilometers lakeshore today, open mine pit edge, uh, but it will be the lakeshore five kilometers and that uh, uh, we, we need to stage that. And, and that could be uh, an idea um, uh, towards uh, this. Um, but I think um, the main challenge and uh, Ruth and uh, Claudia uh, did already pointed that out um, very clear is uh, the competition for space. That is our main problem. Uh, the government, the federal government in, in Dusseldorf wants us uh, to connect forests uh, and green spaces, um, uh, to protect agricultural soils um, and to allow our municipalities to, um, to grow as well as for housing estates as uh, for commercial areas. But um, that's just uh, wishful thinking, isn't it? Uh, and uh, uh, we, we don't have enough space to achieve all these aims. Um, and uh, I think we need to collaborate uh, with a big player, with REE, um, because uh, most of the space is in their property. Um, but we need to develop our own agenda. And, and that is it's, uh, what, what we need to do. So um, and when you I, say we, do you mean the citizens or are you as a government? Yeah, I, I think um, um, the, the, the first step is that the local authorities connect. Um, that's what we are doing in Kraftraum or in SEG Hambach. It's connecting the local authorities uh, and to uh, develop a common plan. And uh, the second is that the local authorities need to gain property uh, to fulfill the common plan. And then you can identify certain areas and you can invite tenders, you can invite investors and land investors uh, to uh, contribute to that plan. Um, but but uh, we, we yes. need to have property. 
Yeah, I think one of the participants uh, also had a question, uh, Rob van Aarschot had a question about engaging these big players, uh, RWE, for example. Uh, Rob, can you restate your, your question? You mean... Uh... It was a, a few questions back already, but... Yeah, that's good. Well, I've, I have two questions. Uh, the role of the regional governments and uh, um, in financing the, the development, but also indeed the role of the RA, because, well, they're a main player in the whole region. And uh, uh, the changes you want to make, I think they are a party in that, but I don't see them uh, named in your presentations. Okay, can can someone from the German side uh, respond? Uh, is it possible and desirable to engage our RWE into landscape uh, projects? Yes, um, um, it is, and we are in in close contact with them. But at the moment, they do have their own problems. Let's say it like this: Yeah, they they have to um, reorganize their whole and very big organization. And um, I think time will come when they um, will have more time for us and our ideas. Well, we are in contact and we are uh, permanently um, giving some ideas and, and what we like to do. But at the moment, um, they are somewhat um, yeah, into their own business. But I think this will, this will change in the next two years when when all these um, laws and um, yeah so the background is settled I think right I can say one thing I think so too I mean I'm just observing and I'm not working for a city government but having worked for the metropolitan region I can see that RVE is contacting or in touch directly with Berlin and sometimes less with the actual surrounding parties, but I think the pressure, and that's great why Kraftraum exists and why collaborating, as you mentioned in your first presentation, Jonas, also is so important because then there's a grasshopper movement and you are making sure that you would like to, you know, impact your own region and also impact the space that's there. And it's a usage conflict, that's for sure. But I think this ownership of property and influence of such big coal mine areas and how they will be integrated into bigger plans in the future is up to the people that also live around it. And I think this is very much happening in the region. It's just that it takes time and it's been dealt with differently for the past 20, 30 years. But I also, just because I see in the chat, I think what's interesting, we have right now also somebody from the um, Aftgold in the chat, we, who mm -hmm. we recently touched upon here in our uh, consultations in the region. And I think this is a cooperative approach maybe he would like to share with us what yes that's is. a good idea yes. yeah because i saw that there was one question specifically yes. about the, um, the not all the farmers want to join in developments or proposed in the kraftraum house situation in rheinisches revier what are the main reasons mm. for farmers to join such a cooperative right. and i think this is the first due to the time we, we need to keep it a bit brief uh, we, i also would like to ask someone from the dutch side to react still uh, but uh, ulrich eckhoff could you quickly react on what you just saw about the foodway. You're from the Earth Gold Cooperative. I will try it very, very quick. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for invitation first. Yeah, And it's very exciting to see that uh, people um, take the, um, the um, topics of the biggest transition mankind ever faced as a chance and not as a risk. Um, so uh, th this transition is still to be pushed but um, the chance is really great. Um, we are, for, for, for sustainable success, um, uh, we need a um, market economy based um, handling or, or doing. Uh, it is not possible to get forward based on uh, subsidi subsidies uh, from, yeah. from the European yeah. community or some, someone else. So private initiative is key yes. in, in making a transition, if yes. you believe. Yes. Therefore, we, with Eftgold, uh, developed the idea to, to find a new product between the conventional farming and the biological farming, while the uh, biological foot is, um, I think, in, in whole Europe, too expensive to to get more market share than in Germany five percent. 
this is not enough yeah and um, all ideas and and all our doing must fit the demand of market we are living in a market economy yeah and it will only be sustainable if we will fit the market demands so we have to decide with all ideas we are preparing what are the advantages for our target groups this is for the region this is for a new product and so actually you you endorse the way we are looking at it with landvesters to make try to make uh, business cases and try to figure out what uh, everybody's absolutely. stake could be in in landscape transitions absolutely but we have to define what is the advantage of our doing for our target group very right. clearly Thank you, uh, Ulrich, for your for your comments. Um, I would like to ask uh, Rob Foot from Orschot to react on uh, the tree grid. Rob, are you there? Or Paul Winkelmole? That's also good. Yeah, the tree grid. I think the tree grid is uh, is a big opportunity also to uh, to collaborate with. Uh, the, the companies on the green corridor and to expand uh, the grid uh, on both sides of the municipalities. We have already uh, realized uh, some uh, kilometers of, of the grid, but in combination with the cultural heritage and uh, the, the uh, redeveloping from nature, that I think there is uh, that is the big uh, the big opportunity that uh, that we can uh, fulfill. Uh, with the municipalities and the companies uh, together. And and I do think you see this also... happening, the, the landfesters uh, yeah, manifesting you... themselves and um, yeah, trying okay. to make deals with you as a, as a government? Yeah, DPD uh, is also uh, an example who already invest uh, in, uh, in, the, in the tree grid and in the, the, the land art. Uh, the logistic so, company. Yes. Yeah, it's a logistic company. So that that's the first uh, sheep and now... Uh, yeah, we need uh, we need to uh, to get uh, to get the other companies also uh, in the car. Okay, do you agree, Paul? <laughs> you have something to add? Yeah, what you see is um, with the green corridor, the, the tree lines. You uh, uh, you you make the connection between the city of Eindhoven and Oslo, but also with the landscape around it, and. Uh, Besides that corridor, you should uh, you can embrace nature, you can uh, ecological uh, structures, you can make the small, the typical small scale uh, landscape uh, structures, and um, that's uh, that makes the land more readable, accessible, and also more interesting to recreate. And so, uh, what what the story is, uh, the Groene Corridor, we say it it is already it was already the the the, the the, the road from Oslot to Eindhoven, so it connects two cities, but it has to connect you with nature, and maybe the nature stop is the next uh, destination of your travel, and that is how you can connect people with nature if they already a little bit investing in in it, a little bit the the story we try to tell. Right, thank you. Um, maybe now a question to to both the the Dutch and the German stakeholders. Um, We've, done, we've been doing this uh, kind of thought experiment of how, what if you put initiative on the private side, uh, how could landscape development uh, benefit from that? Um, could you reflect on that a little bit uh, on uh, also how that works in the Dutch context and the German context? Is there a difference? Um, maybe are there different things needed to facilitate landvesters in these contexts? Um, maybe first Germany. My first uh, idea was um, that in, in the difference between um, both uh, projects, or, or yeah, the difference is that in uh, our case, the supply of energy is a main point uh, because our region um, is not just. Um, uh, uh, trying to uh, to develop our uh, landscape in uh, tree lines uh, or in, in, in green parts or uh, free spaces, um, it must be um, like, I don't know if it's uh, the right uh, translation, it must be coded in different uh, ways. One, one space uh, 
um, has to fulfill a lot of uh, things, yes. Um, so the lines of trees uh, are very nice and uh, Kreisstadt Bergheim uh, tries to, um, to um, insulate uh, it in, 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 in every way, but the farmers themselves are the ones who don't want it uh, because um, it's a thing of, um, yeah, it, uh, it makes their, their work uh, of their parts uh, more difficult. So um, there are a lot of uh, things that you have to uh, reflect and our speedway, for example, from uh, Kreisstadt Bergheim to Elsdorf to the whole, it's in, um, it's a low in, it's, it's laying in low level. So uh, it's not on plain, it's not on plain earth. Yes. Uh, so um, that's uh, also a special thing and a difficulty because um, then you can't uh, uh, make uh, tree lines. I, I, I see. What I want to, I'm what sorry I want to, to interrupt you, uh, Claudia, yeah. because our, our time is almost up and we're being uh, beamed back to the, the main session in a few seconds. So uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, participating. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> okay. I would thank you all for participating. Also, uh, our guest from Germany for joining us today. Uh, thank you all. We will continue this journey um, of the Landvesters. We'll uh, take your questions from the chat and work with that um, and uh, make a publication. And you'll hear from it uh, uh, around the end of the summer from us. We'll keep your address addresses. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, we'll now do a, a Dutch wrap up in the plenary session. And uh, you're also welcome for the, the afternoon program, of course. For our German guests, uh, I think this is goodbye for today. Thank you very much. Um, and let's uh, continue in, in the session of the Landscape Triennial. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye to everyone. Bye. 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 Komt een, uh, die kan het zien. There, a, uh, there is going to be a publication, yes. Okay.